ultimately your concept of yourself is built out of the narratives that we create out of our experience. So all of the experiences that I've had or all the experiences that you have, your idea of Tom is just this vast collection of narratives that you've constructed around your own experiences. And it's layer on top of layer on top of layer on top of layer. And your feeling brain has a certain valence for those experiences. And so if you want to change how you feel about yourself, you have to start peeling back those layers of narrative and, and start getting down into the deepest, earliest ones, because those are often the most impactful and influential. Well, you can't leave us with just that. So how do we begin <laughs> peeling back those layers, man? Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. Today's guest is the New York Times best-selling author of the international smash hit, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. His book, which many consider to be the generation-defining self-help book, sold millions of copies, was translated into 25 languages, and absolutely dominated the bestseller list for a staggering amount of time. It's also been at or near the top of Amazon's most read list continuously since the chart began, and it remains one of the most downloaded audiobooks of all time on Audible. He's also written for or been cited by some of the most prestigious outlets on the planet, including Time, CNN, BBC News, Business Insider, Yahoo News, The Huffington Post, and many, many more. Additionally, he's published hundreds of blog articles, which are viewed by millions of people every month, making him one of the most visible and studied authors of our time. So please help me in welcoming the founder and CEO of Infinity Squared Media, the author of the recent book, Everything is Fucked, a book about hope, Mark Manson. What's up, man? How are you? Welcome to the show. Thanks. That's a, that's a nice intro. I should, uh, should have you do my, my PR. <laughs> I'd be happy to do it, man. Look, the stats are staggering. So yeah. putting something like that together is pretty easy. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm sure that kind of thing really took you by surprise. But what you've done with it in terms of really um, giving some self-help that is very direct mm. and just sort of says it like it is in a voice that I think people can relate to is, is really amazing. And I'm super excited to have you here and Thanks. go good. into some of these topics. Yeah, it's good to be here. Especially the new book, yep. which I think is lovely. Everything is fucked. That's a nice title. Certainly <laughs> uh, catches your attention. The thing that I found most interesting is the talk about values mm -hmm. and like how much values begin to inform your identity. And basically, your values are essentially who you are. Yes. Take us into that. What does it mean? And then how much malleability is there in values? Sure. So my, my focus in my work has always been value focused. Um, I feel like in the self-help and self-development world, there's so much focus on success, you know, getting ahead in your career, starting a business, making more money, having better relationships, but nobody's actually standing back and defining what success is. Like, is our definition of success valuable or not? Um, and I think especially in today's you know crazy internet world where we're exposed to everything um deciding what we're choosing to define as success is is a more important question than ever before um so that's kind of what got me started on the whole value question in general and then when i started investigating it and doing a lot of research and writing about it i started to discover that like basically you know if you think of like how how a, you define a person in general um as humans, we, we tend to define people by their choices, by their actions. Um, but then what motivates their actions? Well, often it's how they feel. And then what, what motivates how they feel about certain things? And it's their perception of what's valuable and what's not. And so that's kind of how I drilled down to, to this idea that essentially what we are is just an aggregation of what we choose to value in this world. If I value money more than anything else, that will come to define me through my actions, my behaviors, what I invest my time and attention into. If I value family, um, that will define who I am because everything else will flow from that. Yeah, the thing that I find interesting about values is people 
often act as if they are empirical truths, like money is valuable or yes. family is valuable, and they don't realize that it was a choice often handed to them by the way they grew up, their parents, what their parents instilled in them. And so stepping back and recognizing that all of this is a choice, that you can consciously decide what you're going to value. Yeah. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how the process works of deciding to value something. So if somebody finds themselves in a yeah. place where they feel totally fucked up, they don't like who they are, and they buy into this notion that, okay, a lot of this is being driven by values, how do they actually change that? Yeah, it, it's funny because I'm not a huge fan of a lot of like kind of the typical self-help tropes, but the answer to this question I, I think is kind of classic visualization, but it's not the visualization that w we usually hear about. So what I talk about in the book is that you, like let's say let's say I'm just really superficial and I value money more than anything. Like I've got like a fleet of yachts and it's it's all I care about, you know. Um, and then something happens in my life and I realize that that's pretty superficial. I should like grow up a bit and you know value something else. And it's not as simple as just deciding. Like we've all had that experience in our lives where we wish we cared about something that we don't, or vice versa. We wish we didn't care about something that we do, and you can't just stop. Um, and so the, the process that I describe in the book is that essentially before you can commit to a new value, you kind of have to like try them on. Like, like it's like going to a store and trying on a bunch of pairs of clothes. Um, and the way you try on a new value is you need to sit down and, and visualize and you can even write it out if you want. But it's like, let's say all I care about is my fleet of boats and, uh, and I want to try on a new value, um, like charity or something. I have to sit down and start asking myself, what would it mean for my life? What would it mean for me as a person if I didn't value those boats anymore? Um, and that's a very hard question. It, it really, it messes us up because we realize that a lot of our relationships would probably fall apart. A lot of our business commitments would probably fall apart. Um, a lot of our understanding of ourselves would be shaken up or, or questioned. And it's a very difficult thing to ask. Um, and so, you know, most of the times when you see visualization taught in the self-help industry, it's like they take a guy who wants a fleet of boats and they say, visualize a fleet of boats, now go get it. And it's like, no, no, no. What you need to do is take a guy who wants a fleet of boats and say, visualize not wanting a fleet of boats. What would that say about you? Who would you be if that thing you always desired was not your desire anymore? Yeah, that to me is really interesting. And you went through a pretty cool moment like that where you said, ultimately this all comes down to choices. And mm -hmm. for a long time in your life, you just always assumed you were gonna be a musician. That was like where yeah. you were headed. And then choosing to do the writing instead. And the, the thing that really interested me in that was you said there was a period of mourning. Yeah. Why is there a period of mourning? You know, what's going on as we reshape ourselves? So my background is a, is a little bit Buddhist and I subscribe to the belief of, of no self, essentially, that, that our conception of who we are is just kind of this arbitrary imagined thing in our brain. And so I think of our relationship with ourselves as being a, basically functioning the same way as like our relationship with another human being. Um, so when something, when you lose a part of yourself, so I spent pretty much all my, my early life wanting to be a musician. That was my ambition. It was my hobby, my passion. It's how I spent all my time. And I went to music school and I just got the shit kicked out of me. And I was like, oh, this is not going to work anymore. And the process of letting go of that value was, was very much similar to like a breakup. Like it felt like losing a girlfriend or losing a friendship. Like this thing that gave all this meaning and emotion to my life was now unavailable to me. And whenever you, you lose something like that, you go through the same emotional process, which is that, a pro that process of grieving or mourning, because the same way you know, a breakup leaves you grieving this beautiful thing in your life that no longer exists, when you lose an important value or an important part of yourself, you also grieve this beautiful thing that defined your life and no longer defines it. 
Yeah, that I think is, um, it's such a critical thing to understand how your identity begins to get tied up in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of this hinges on um, what you talked about right off the top, which is how we define success. Yeah. So how do you help people in that so that they don't succumb to a trap? Um, I know you're, the example that you gave in, in one of your articles I thought was so hilarious, which is the being driven, being ambitious towards something without taking a moment to reflect in the morality of what you've decided yeah. to value. And you said, take Hitler, who's <laughs> one of the most driven people and has had this tremendous impact, um, but was a psychopath. Yeah. So walk us through, like, you, you go pretty into like how we can sort of reason our way to really having a base understanding of heard you talk about Kant and like morality yeah. at like a really deep level. Yeah. So how do we begin to, to get to a base level of like, okay, now I'm gonna stack my belief system, my values on top of this base. Sure. Um, just a little background on the Hitler thing for our viewers. <laughs> you think you need to clarify? I don't understand. <laughs> no, I've, I've wanted for so long, I've wanted, I, I had this idea with a friend we got drunk and went paintballing and and I <laughs> as you do yeah where most of my ideas come from and uh and I, I was talking to him I was like you know it'd be amazing if if you did like a if you did like a Tim Ferriss style podcast with like a fake Hitler and you're like so Adolf what's your morning routine <laughs> you know like how do you rally the troops how do you inspire millions of people and it, it would just be this beautiful satire of kind of like like focusing on that point of like if so, if you're not improving yourself for the right reasons, you could be damaging yourself. You know, the, the why behind everything, everything you try to improve or everything that you're driven towards is, is more important than actually, you know, how far you get. So for me, it's, it's, I, I see a very direct connection between self-improvement and ethics. Um, I think, if you if you dig deep enough into these questions of, of what growth means or what improvement means, you inevitably run into what is better, period. What is better or worse, period. What makes a better life? What makes humanity better? Um, and so it, it's my goal has always been, I, I never wanna be that guy on stage who's like, this is what you should do. This is how you do it. Here's my five step method, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I want to be the guy who, who doesn't, I don't want to give answers. I want to give better questions. I want to help people sort through these questions in themselves because ultimately the, these questions around values are so personal. There's, there's no way for me to answer any individual without inserting my values onto them. And when you do that, you rob them of the ability to choose what matters for themselves, choose their own meaning in their life. Um, so for me, it's just, it's all about just pointing people in the right direction, pointing out, you know, little hypocrisies or little like kind of paradoxes and, and trying to steer them towards um, finding their own answers. So give me some of those better questions and what should we be asking ourselves? Um, well, you know, the, the, the classic thing is always like, you know, write down, a list of goals or whatever, I, I, I would go past that. I'd say, you know, write down your goals and then ask yourself, why do I want each of these goals? What would it mean in my life if I accomplished these goals? Um, similarly, you know, a common exercise is like write down things you're grateful for. Um, ask yourself, why are you grateful for them? What would happen to your life if you didn't have them? I mean, that, that's the crazy thing is that a lot of, a lot of times the things we're most grateful for are actually the things that we're all fucked up about, you know, it's like, it's, if you had asked me, uh, uh, when I was, um, you know, in one of, like I, I had a series of very dysfunctional relationships. I was happy as a pig in shit in the middle of those, you know, I would be like, Oh, my girlfriend is the most, most beautiful thing. And, you know, and it's like, no dude, like you're, I was a mess. Um, and so we, we it's not just about questioning, uh, you know, the bad things in our life, you know, like why did this painful thing happen? You need to question the good things as well. Like why, why does this feel good? Is it, does it feel good for a good reason? Um, because there are a lot of things that feel good that are actually hurting you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that I really wanna dive into is so how do we begin to establish what we think is good? What does it mean to be better? Mm -hmm. um, 
and you come to this from an ethical place, and I know that you don't want to like direct people sure. too much and say believe this or whatever, but what are some jumping off points? Like, is it to go read philosophy? You said that you approach life as a Buddhist. Like, yeah. how can people begin to build that framework for themselves? Because what, what I'm really trying to get to is I feel like you have to have a base belief of some kind yes. upon which things stack, but yes. I don't think people think about that. Yes. And even just pointing them in a direction of, of how to start, begin defining that for themselves, I think would be super helpful. Yeah, so for me, I found that. Uh, I talk about Kant in the book. Um, I was very inspired by Kant's moral philosophy. Basically, he has this principle called the formula of humanity, which is essentially, it's, it's so simple, but it kind of explains everything. He says that always act in such a way that you never merely treat people, a person as a means, mm -hmm. but always as an end. Um, and what that means is like, don't use people, you know, like anything you do, uh, the whole point of what you do, what you do, like the end goal of what you do should always be a person, whether it's yourself or somebody else. So like, if you're like kind of misleading somebody or, or just saying something to somebody just to get them to like, I don't know, give you some money or, you know, make them like you a little bit, um, you know, under that principle, like that's that is not growth. That is not success. Um, any basic stuff like lying, cheating, stealing, like all of those are examples of using people as a means to some other end rather than treating the person as an end of, in the, of themselves. Um, so I, I, when I came across that principle, it just, for me, it kind of blew me back on just how universal and, and powerful and useful it was. Um, because in, in, you know, I spent a lot of time writing about dating and relationships and, and I, I was coming from a place where I, you know, my philosophy around relationships was always like the thing that screws relationships up is treating people as a means, is being transactional in your relationships. Um, and so when I found that con stuff, I was like, damn, this dude gets it. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is very interesting. And if you had to... Um, and, and look, you've urged people not to take you too seriously. And so I yeah. asked this question knowing <laughs> that, but like, um, if you had to define success in a sentence, sure. um, how would you define it? Whew. I, for me, success means, um, creating a life and creating a world with better problems. That's interesting. That reminds me of a quote of yours, I'm going to paraphrase, but um, if you want purpose in your life, the most important thing you need to do is answer honestly the following question, what is your favorite flavor of shit sandwich? <laughs> Which I thought was absolutely phenomenal. That is the absolute right yep. question. But what do you mean by that? Uh, it's basically anything you pursue, like our mind plays this little trick on us, which is uh, when we want something, our, our, our brain only shows us the good side of it. It doesn't show the, sacri the sacrifice required for it. Um, and everything, every experience you have in life, there is a shit sandwich part of it. You know, there's, there's everything has its associated problems. Um, but our brain doesn't think about that when we're pursuing it. And so uh, for me, like one of the most powerful heuristics is to simply, instead of thinking about what benefits I want, uh, in my life, I, I try to think about what problems do I want in my life? Um, you know, it, it's something as simple as like, you know, people might see this show and they're like, oh, damn, I wish I had a badass show like that on YouTube. You know, it's like they don't understand like there's a whole crew here. There's logistics. There's like waivers you got to get like clear through lawyers and all, all sorts of crap. And it's like those are the problems you chose. You know, those are the problems that you wanted to have. Um, and that's why it's a successful show. It's not just because it's like, oh, damn. I'm mean, a show would be awesome, you know? Like it's easy to just want something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, your whole concept around struggle I think is really powerful. Um, you talk really interestingly about emotions in the book. You yeah. go into the um, Newton's uh, emotional laws, mm -hmm. which I thought were really interesting. Why is it so important, especially as it relates to willpower, to understand your emotions, to leverage them. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, when you talk about emotions, there's an inherent sense of like, don't always trust your emotions. Sure. So untangle this emotional knot for us. <laughs> emotions are, are, are messy for a lot of reasons. But, but one of the, the key things that I talk about is 
I use I use this analogy of a car. If your consciousness is a car, um, you have two brains in it. You have a feeling brain and a thinking brain. And most people's assumption is that the thinking brain is the responsible one driving and the feeling brain is like the bratty little kid in the passenger seat screaming and pointing at stuff out the window. And it's like, it's the job of your thinking brain to like keep two hands on the wheel and be like, shut up, shut up, I'm trying to drive here, you know? And it's, as a culture, we look at anybody who fails to control their impulses or their emotions um, as somebody as somebody who's just fundamentally failing to drive their own car. Um, we see it as a failure of willpower and discipline. But the truth is, if you if you dig into all the psychological literature, it's the feeling brain is actually driving the car, and. And he's a little bit crazy. He's like, I, I compare him to like an angry boyfriend who refuses to stop for directions. Like he just wants to go wherever he wants to go. And he's not going to listen to anything. And the thinking brain is actually in the passenger seat. Like our conscious mind is a passenger in our own behavior who has deluded himself into thinking that he's driving even though he's not. And what I talk about is that the, the power of the thinking brain is that we get to draw the map. The thinking brain gets to decide what what the lay of the land is. So even though we don't totally have control over uh, what's pushing us forward, our actions, our emotions, all those things, we do have control over the meaning and the interpretation of those actions and emotions. And so what I talk about is that to develop a real sense of control in your life, to feel that, feel a sense of self-discipline, it's not about beating your emotions in the, into submission because that, that just causes greater neuroticism and compulsion. The trick is, is that you got to get the two brains to talk to each other. Um, and, and it's hard because they speak different languages, you know? So it's instead of like just trying to get your feeling brain to shut up, you need to ask your feeling brain, well, how does this make you feel? You know, it's like, oh, how, how does waking up at 5 a.m. and going to the gym feel? And the feeling brains be like, oh, that feels awful. Like, why would you ever do that? And, and then the thinking brain needs to be like, okay, okay, that's okay. You know, I hear you. Um, but why does it feel bad? You know, what about 6 a.m.? Feeling brain's like, well, that's not as bad. You know, and it would feel nice to work out, I guess. You know, and so you, it becomes this like negotiation between the two sides of yourself. And, um, and there are a lot of like kind of mental tricks to coax to like kind of work with your emotions to leverage your emotions um, and get get the feeling brain pointed in the direction you want it um, rather than just fighting it for your entire life yeah i love that i want to go farther on that so um going back to the shit sandwich the whole idea of like what are the things that you actually want to struggle with yeah um how do we like think of willpower in terms of aligning with the the things that are hard that you enjoy. And I think that your own example of, I thought I wanted to be a musician, but writing was the thing that made me lose track of time. Like, I, yeah. I feel like that does a great job of addressing this. Yeah, I think there are things in our lives where we don't even, I, I think the things that we tend to be passionate about, we don't even realize we're passionate about them because they seem so normal and obvious to us. So for instance, to use, to use the music and the, the writing example, I remember when I was in, in music school, I was practicing, I played guitar. So I was practicing like six hours a day, just beating my head against the wall, trying to learn all these different songs and stuff. And I just, I hated, it, it was a grind and it, it felt like a, a job I was supposed to do. And I remember actually right before I quit, I, uh, there, was a, there was a kid in the program who was like, you know, he was an all-star. Like he, he, everybody knew he was gonna make it, you know. Um, and it's funny today. I think he has two or three Grammys. But um, so, like, I found him in the cafeteria, and I sat down with him, and I'm like, "Oh man, like, I don't know. Like, how do you? Can you give me some advice, man?" He's like, "Yeah, sure. What's going on?" I'm like, "Just uh, how do you practice this much? Like, I'm practicing like six hours a day." you know, how much are you practicing? And he's like, yeah, six hours a day. And I'm like, but yeah, but how do you like stay motivated? How do you, like, what's your warm up like? You know, like how do you, how do you schedule your practice time? And he's just looking at me like I'm speaking Klingon. Like he's, <laughs> he's like, what are you talking about? Like, 
I just practice. Like, I always practice. Like, whoa. It, it didn't even compute for him. And then I was like, okay, I, I should probably quit. Um, <laughs> so jump ahead like five, six years, I had started blogging. And I would go to these like internet marketing conferences and stuff. And people would start coming up to me and they're like, oh man, I love your blog. And like your articles are... They're like 10, 20 pages long. You're posting like multiple each week. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. They're like, man, it's incredible. So, uh, you know, what's your writing regimen like? Like, how, how do you get yourself motivated? You know, he starts asking me all these questions and I'm like looking at him like, what are you talking about? Like, I just write, <laughs> you know, I just sit down and write, you know, I don't even have to think about it. And, uh, and it kind of like rung a bell in my head of like, wait a second, like that's, that's that's something that's like a, that's a signal that there's something special about this because for whatever reason what seems to cause other people a lot of stress and pain comes easily to me and what causes me a lot of stress and pain you know came easily to to the guy who did make it through music school um and so I realized that it's it's not about like grit or willpower or just like wanting it enough. It, it's a lot of it too. It's just we're all masochists a little bit, you know. Like we all there's some pain in the world that we all it gets us off a little bit. And I found mine. And uh, and so yeah, I just you just you just keep hitting that shit. Like you just keep going. And um, I think people, when they're when you're so focused on pleasure and and pleasant rewards, you don't actually get to that question. You don't actually get to like, yeah, what's what's that pain that like actually kind of gets me going, you know? And because we all have it, and that that's that's the sweet spot when you can find it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I love how much you um, sort of orbit around emotions and how people can really get in connection with what using my own language would be sort of the neurochemical reality of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, walk us through the the three, um, Newton's three laws of emotions. I found okay. these to be really, really interesting, speaking of gravitational pull. I've always found Newton's life super fascinating because not only was he like one of the smartest guys ever, but when you read about his life, like he was a total head case, like had a very traumatic childhood, suffered a lot of abuse and just was very antisocial and emotionally dysfunctional his entire life. Um, and so I thought it would be really cool to kind of use him and his life as an example to demonstrate a lot of these topics that we're talking about, you know, in terms of uh, identity, growth, self-discipline, etc. And so I took his three laws of motion and I, I basically just created emotional analogs of those. So the first one was uh, um, for every action, there's an equal and opposite emotional reaction. And this is basically the, just the idea that every emotion is simply a, re a response to, to either pain or the absence of pain. Um, so when you remove pain from life, a positive emotion emerges in reaction. And, and if you add pain into life, a negative emotion uh, emerges. Um, the second one. So the second one, if I remember right, was uh, our self worth equals the sum of our emotions over time. So you could even you, you might even say like identity equals our, our uh, emotions over time. So basically, let's say something traumatic happens in your childhood. Um, that that pain early on in your life causes a lot of negative emotions. And one of the things that I talk about is that anytime we feel an emotion, it compels us to, to do what I call equalizing, which is um, like if I'm angry at you, I'm going to continue to be angry at you until I either get, you know, retaliate or you apologize. Like something needs to happen to make that anger go away. There needs to be some sort of like equalization between us. And if there is no equalization, that anger just kind of simmers and sits there um, forever. And one of the reasons why childhood traumas are so debilitating for people is that essentially these extremely painful experiences occur to our feeling brains while our thinking brains are still undeveloped and don't know how to explain or create meaning around that pain. So let's say something really painful happened to me now, I'd be like, oh, well, you know, he meant well and, you know, shit happens or whatever. But if I'm like a five-year-old, my explanation for it only gets as far as like, I'm a bad, 
I'm a bad boy. I'm a bad person. And the world hates me. You know, like that's, and that will stick um, because it doesn't get equalized and it'll stick for the rest of my life. And the problem is, is that we forget that that painful thing happens. So we just kind of go through life with this, uh, feeling of inferiority and, and pain that lingers that we can't really put an explanation to or explain away. Um, and so the process of therapy is basically unraveling a lot of our experiences until we get back to that original experience. And with our adult thinking brain, we can now put meaning to that pain that is helpful to us, essentially. Um, so that's the second law, is that our identity is, is the sum of our emotions over time. Um, and then the third law is uh, our identity will continue to be our identity until new experience acts against us. So to use the music school example, um, I was a musician. I would introduce myself as a musician. And then I got to second semester of music school and, um, and had my ass handed to me. And suddenly I'm like, oh shit, I'm not a musician anymore, <laughs> you know? And now I have to go around and it's like, I'm not a musician. I don't know what I am. But it, it required, there was some new contrary experience that was required um, to create that shift within me. And, uh, and this is why identity change by definition needs to be painful and uncomfortable. Mm. Because if it's not painful or uncomfortable, uh, nothing's changing, nothing's shifting. There might be a perception of a change, but ultimately the only way our values change is that uh, life knocks us on our ass a little bit and causes us to question everything we understand. Yeah, the whole process of um, losing an identity, mourning that, trying to find or create uh, a new sense of self, I think is uh, one, very misunderstood, yeah. um, and two, really, really critical. You talk about people breaking away and quote unquote finding themselves in a moment of crisis. Walk us through that and I'd love to hear if that's what you were doing. You're so well traveled, yeah. 60 plus countries, speak three languages. Was that a part of that redefinition for you? Were you seeking experience? Like how do you advise people who are, they don't know, I don't know if I'm a writer, I don't know if I'm a musician, yeah. I don't know what shit sandwich I enjoy. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. you know, how do you help people through that process? I think there's an exploration phase. Um, because it's, it's, if you have this identity, you have this perception of who you are, and then suddenly that's yanked away from you, there's kind of just this void there. Um, and so I think there needs to be an exploration to find, basically find your shit sandwich, essentially. And, uh, <laughs> um, and you, it's, it takes time, it takes patience, and I think they're, probably the most helpful thing you can do is just be okay with not knowing. Let's talk about building resilience. You said something early that I found really interesting, which is that you have a relationship with yourself the way that you have with somebody else. Yeah. Which is really fascinating. Tell me about that. Like, what do you mean by that? And, and then like the whole notion of, ah, I forget the exact word you used, but you said, I approach this like a Buddhist. The self is an illusion. I don't think you said that, but it was like, it made yes. me feel that way. Yes, yes, yes. I, I said it's an arbitrary construct, which yeah, illusion. Um, I think, uh, so our relationship with ourselves, like essentially what self-esteem is or self-worth is, basically, let me back up for a second. The feeling brain, so the thinking brain thinks in terms of like logic, cause and effect, correlations, things like that. The feeling brain thinks in terms of importance. Um, it thinks in terms of values. So. Some things are very valuable and worthy of our of being pursued, and other things are very, very not valuable, and they're you, they should be avoided. Um, and the feeling brain kind of designates, you know, almost a, a value score for everything, every experience, every potential experience that we we can consider, including ourselves. So our idea of what our self is is just another idea the same way um you know being living in new york is an idea and i there is a certain value i place on that and that that idea has logical connections to all sorts of things that who i am as mark manson is simply a constructed idea in my mind 
And as a constructed idea, my feeling brain has either positive or negative valuations and feelings for, for Mark Manson. Um, when people have a low valuation of themselves, when they have, when their feeling brain thinks that their identity is not valuable and, and have negative emotions about it, uh, we call that low self-esteem. And when our, the idea of ourself, ha our feeling brain has a high valuation of it and has positive feelings for it, we call that high self-esteem. And so a lot of like therapeutic work for many decades was kind of almost obsessed of like just trying to get people, people's, this relationship between your feeling brain and your conception of your identity to get it, to get the needle to move from negative to positive. Um, because there are all sorts of, you know, positive repercussions of that. Um, but ultimately, the, your, your concept of yourself is built out of um, the narratives that we create out of our experience. So all of the experiences that I've had or all the experiences that you have, you know, your idea of Tom is just this vast collection of uh, narratives that you've constructed around your own experiences. And it's layer on top of layer on top of layer on top of layer. And your feeling brain has a certain, you know, valence for those experiences. Um, and so if you want to change how you feel about yourself, you have to start peeling back those layers of narrative and, and start getting down into the deepest, earliest ones because those are often the most impactful and influential. Well, you can't leave us with just that. So how do we begin <laughs> peeling back those layers, man? Like I'm so with you on that. Yeah. And the way that people construct their sense of self and beliefs and yeah. values and it's like this just crazy rat's nest sure. of unidentified, unexplained beliefs, feelings, reactions, long-held wounds that have never been dealt with from your childhood. Yeah. I mean, it's, but, but that act of peeling that stuff back, I think is also an act of rewriting. Yes. So it's like, ah, Absolutely. I've identified this narrative. Now yeah. what narrative do I change it to? Yeah. And so going back to your, your driving analogy, you've got this thinking brain whose job is to basically rewrite the map of a past experience. Yeah. How do you help people take control of that? Or do you have thoughts around how they can take control of that? Are there, like, I, I would say I have a very strong thesis about whatever you rewrite, like the guiding principle mm -hmm. should not be a guiding principle of objective truth because I think people are atrocious <laughs> yeah. at figuring out what is actually objectively true. Sure. So if you could, that would be amazing. But since you can't, yeah. focus entirely on what's empowering. So using your language, what moves the needle to something positive? Yeah. Do you have a guiding principle that you tell people to utilize when thinking about that rewriting process? I think... So everybody's a little bit different. And this is how I see like therapy, meditation, journaling, like a lot of these therapeutic practices, like I see them, they're all different versions of what you just said. Is like peeling that layer back, looking at it, being like, huh, maybe that's not true. What, what if this idea was true instead? Like trying on new uh, narratives and, and, and stories that define ourselves. Um, so everybody, you know, everybody kind of has their own, you know, practice that will resonate with them more. Um, but it's in terms of like how to actually go about it. I think the first step is to just decide that you don't actually know who you are. Again, it's the Buddhist thing. It's like the self's an illusion. It's an arbitrary construct that you've spun up uh, over the course of your life. And so it's just this thing. It's just this idea. It's a subjective uh, it's a subjective idea and it can be anything you want. Now you don't, that doesn't mean you necessarily like want to become delusional and <laughs> decide that you're Spider-Man and, and you're going to be president of Ukraine. Like it's, you want to be, you want to be tethered to reality, but also understand that you don't, like you said, you never know for certain who you actually are. You don't actually know what's true. You don't know if you're a good person or a bad person. You don't know if you're a musician or an author, I could label my label myself anything. So I think when we we start to realize that at how uh, kind of lose that certainty about who we are, or what we think we know about ourselves, that kind of like it starts to loosen the glue of that that ball that ball of yarn of stories that we've told ourselves. 
Um, and once that glue is loosened, you can more easily pull pull threads out and, and, and start to see like, oh, well, yeah, that's, that's definitely not, um, you know, that's probably not the most helpful narrative that I could create for myself. So I guess, I guess that would be the second step. You know, first step, lose the certainty. Second step is to actually like pull on some of these threads and then, um, and then question, you know, what if that wasn't true? Like, what if, what if music school didn't kick my ass? What if I just, what if I just didn't try hard enough? You know, like, could be true. What would that mean about me? It's useful to sit down and think, think through those things because it's by doing that enough that you, you start to stumble upon epiphanies and, and like big realizations about what you've been telling yourself your whole life. We have to understand that our identities are, are not logically constructed, they are emotionally constructed. And they are emotionally constructed based on our feelings and they, are, they have an inertia to them, to bring it back to the Newton's laws, our identities have an inertia to them that uh, is extremely difficult to stop or reverse. Um, and you, you definitely can't do it just through logical arguments or, you know, punishing somebody. So how the hell do we put ourselves in those difficult situations? Like, how do we seek them out? I think, uh, I think it's, it's, it's just a healthy habit to develop the desire to challenge yourself in, in every sense, physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, you know, one thing I definitely started trying to do um, especially recently, given like the political climate that's been going on, is I seek out articles and news sources that I disagree with, um, because I I see the the bubbles that everybody's in and and the tribal lines that everybody's drawing, and I am I'm horrified by it, but I also want to try my best to not succumb to that myself, and so. Um, yeah, I read sources, I read books of things I disagree with, and, and, it's, and it changes me. It, it really does. It, it softens me. Um, sometimes I'll finish the book and I'm like, well, I still don't agree with them, but damn, I respect them now. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a smart person. Um, and so that, that, that's one way I do it intellectually. Uh, but I think it's, you know, that carries over into all areas of life. I mean, it's as simple as... Um, you know, if you go to the gym, it's like challenge yourself to do something new. Take a class that, you know, like my wife just at the age of 37 decided she wanted to learn how to swim. And she's like mortified of it, you know. But I'm like, hell yeah, go do it. You know, like that's because it's not just about swimming. It's it's about just developing that consistent habit of like stepping into your discomfort. I love that. Who was who was it that you you quoted them? They said either to their daughter or niece. It was a famous writer, I think, um, that the whole idea of getting better at life is about surrounding yourself with people that disagree with you or don't think like you think. Yeah, I'm putting you on the spot here, but yeah. I thought I thought that was such an interesting idea about getting yourself around disconfirmation, getting yourself yeah. around people that shake you out of your cognitive biases. I think that's really powerful. Man, I, I really think in this book you're on to some of the most fundamental and important things that a human being can do to change who they are. I think it is super powerful and way extraordinary. I have no doubt that the um, author hat, author identity is a good identity for you. <laughs> cool. um, where can people find you? Where can they get the book? So website is markmanson.net. There's hundreds of articles there. Um, encourage people to check it out. Uh, book is available everywhere. Um, every store you can imagine, it should be there. So go check it out. Um, and I will be doing a speaking tour um, across US, Canada, and hopefully Australia and UK. Nice. Um, so you can learn about that. Go to either go to my Facebook page, which is Facebook slash Mark Manson net or markmanson.net slash book dash tour. Nice. All right. What's the impact that you want to have on the world? I want to expand and I basically, I just want to challenge people. I want to challenge people to find new perspectives and to, to keep, I, I think if you look at what human progress is, it's 
ultimately rooted in the the search and the the discovery and the testing of new perspectives and, and taking the same experience and rewriting the meaning around it. And so um, I see my work very much as training brains to do that better. I like that a lot. My man, thank you so much for coming on Thanks the show. That was me. absolutely extraordinary. Guys, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Brother, that was amazing. Thank you. Good shit. What's up, Impactivist? If you want to acquire new skills or improve the ones you already have, then you're going to love this. As you know, a huge part of my life is about acquiring skills that have utility and exist in service of something greater than myself, and that is why I highly recommend Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 25,000 classes across more skills than you can imagine. At Impact Theory, we've used Skillshare for things like project management, marketing analytics, and even for our comic book. And today, Skillshare is giving the first 500 people who click on the link in the description two free months to their entire library of courses. That's 60 days access to literally thousands of courses on whatever topics you choose for no money at all. You just have to click on the link in the description below and join the classes that work for you. And you will be in very good company as one of 7 million people on Skillshare. And should you decide to stick around beyond your free trial, an annual subscription to Skillshare is less than $10 a month. That's nothing for a skill that could very well change your life. So go ahead and click on the link in the description below to start acquiring those skills today. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. I want to influence them. I want to get inside your skin, inside your brain, and alter how you look at the world. I think this change in your perspective and how you look and socialize and deal with people will radically alter so many aspects in your life.